Good evening, everyone. You are all very welcome to our webinar this evening. My name is Mary McGuckin and I'm from the Department of Marketing, Tourism and Sport here in the Institute of Technology in Sligo. I'm going to be your host for this evening's webinar. This webinar is one of a series of web a series of webinars that's being provided by the Institute of Technology here in Sligo. And a few weeks ago, um, some of my colleagues in the Department of Business Studies provided an excellent webinar which focused on helping businesses to go online. The focus of this evening's webinar is to explore the challenges, but even more importantly, the opportunities for tourism, for hospitality, for retail, as indeed other sectors in our region. We are really delighted to be joined by two top class industry experts, Miriam Simons and Stephen Rice, who are going to share their experiences and their insights. Um, they're going to look at, for example, the changing consumer, they will talk about how companies uh, can adapt in a more agile manner to this so-called new normal that we have found ourselves in as a result of the coronavirus. Uh, Miriam and Stephen will also offer some tips and uh, some ideas really about how to be innovative and creative going forward. So I just want to explain the format of this evening's webinar. Um, everyone's mic is muted, uh, but you can post questions or comments through our online chat, which should appear on your screen. And after Miriam and Stephen have spoken, after they've given their presentation this evening, we will address some of the questions that you have, you know, that you've given us, that you've provided us with, and we'll try and get through as many of those as possible. Tonight's webinar is being recorded. Um, it is, it will be available on our website. So now we're going to go to our first speaker this evening. Miriam Simon is a highly successful and experienced retailer. She's a business mentor and she's an accredited executive coach with over 30 years experience working at board level with companies such as TK Maxx, uh, B&Q, Lifestyle Sports and Monsoon. She's been on the Enterprise Ireland mentoring panel and she is also an advisor to Ireland's finalists for the SME instrument Horizon 2020 programme in Europe. Miriam is the founder of a consultancy firm called PTO, and they, her company specializes in consumer and trading strategy. She's run workshops and webinars around Ireland, including the highly acclaimed Restarting Retail and Creating Your Retail Battle Plan. Miriam is ranked by LinkedIn in the top 1% for retail. So I am now going to hand you over to Miriam and she's going to talk you through her presentation and then we will come to Stephen Rice is going to is going to be our second speaker for this evening. Thank you. Over to you, Miriam. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say a huge thanks to Mary and to Sligo IT for inviting Stephen and myself along this evening to, to speak to you about opportunities for tourism and trade. Um, I'm going to start quite punctually because I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious we have a lot to cover. Um, so as Mary said, if you have any questions, please do type them into the track, into the chat. We're hoping to stay on track um, so that we have plenty of time for a queue and a at the end. My hope really for the for, for the next hour and a half between Stephen and myself is that we'll hopefully be able to give you some ideas that might help move business forward as we graduate through these rather extraordinary times. So. So, oh, I've lost the sharing screen. Let me just go back in. So beg your pardon. So let's go on to the next uh, screen. So even without COVID, um, retail was already having a very difficult time, so you, you only need to look at some of these headlines and you'll notice that they're not new headlines. Um, some of them are as old as two years old. Retail prior to COVID-19 was already in, in huge change and in, in a state of flux before the current crisis. But I just want to take a moment and look at some other industries also. So if you think about the newspaper industry and, and think about how many people would buy a newspaper every day now compared to maybe even four or five years ago. So I'm thinking less than five years ago, I would have been working in Dublin city centre. Um, my husband and I probably would have bought a morning paper each day and at least one of us would have picked up the Herald on the way home. 
And then at the weekend, we might have bought a couple of broadsheets. Um, you know, that's maybe a dozen papers a week. That's a heck of a lot of paper. Nowadays, we might be lucky to pick up two newspapers in a week. So newspaper industry, huge change over the, the last five years. Actually, so then if you look at the car industry, uh, this is another industry that's gone through massive change. So if you think in the last few years, it's been a massive focus on um, on hybrid cars and on uh, electric uh, cars. Um, the, the focus is increasing on carbon emissions. So um, also, if you think this time last year, diesel was still a major focus. So diesel the last 10 years has been a major priority car for most of us. And then at the beginning of this year, diesel suddenly became um, a little bit demonized. So it went from angel to devil very, very quickly. And then the beauty industry. So if you look back over the last five or 10 years ago, if you went and had your eyebrows shaped, for example, you were you were positively posh and consumer expectations are now almost on a on a par with Hollywood surgeons. You know, we expect uh, very, very high standards in the beauty industry these days. And even banking. So I think AIB came out in February with a statement to say that they were going to start reducing the number of ATMs across Ireland over the coming years because there was less demand for cash. And, and actually following the pandemic, I would say even more so. So the point here is that nearly every industry is seeing huge change. And the difference is us. It's, 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 it's us. It's the consumer that's actually changing. And yes, some of this is about the world becoming more digitally entrenched. It absolutely is. But alongside that, there are some quite serious social and generational changes at work also. So when we look at the future of retail, and, and I'm going to have a, a look today at three overarching and distinct trends, um, we're going to uh, have a look at. And these trends haven't been changed by COVID. They've been speeded up by COVID. So um, just want to say I'm not here to talk about augmented reality and and drones delivering groceries. There's lots of very serious high tech experts that will talk about that better than I do. What I want to do today is talk on a very practicable level about where I think retail is heading and also why local retail and the independents have the absolute advantage. Now, this is a little bit of my background, but um, um, uh, Mary already covered that, so I'm going to scoot on. So the, the first trend that I'm going to talk to you about is this blended approach or relationship between stores and e-commerce or digital. So this is the you do need a website bit. So bear with me, because whilst I'm saying that, it may not be in the context that you think. So there is a perception out there that the, the store retail is dead and that everything's going to go online. And, and when we were in lockdown, it probably really did feel like that, I think. For grocery, I think a lot of businesses will increasingly move online because grocery is a functional purchase. It's, it's not an emotional purchase, it's a functional purchase primarily. And a lot more people will have been forced to experience grocery shopping online and will have found that it was very convenient. So I think, uh, you know, food shopping, there will be a shift for some more food shopping to go online. But for most retail, um, as in the physical physical retail, bricks and mortar stores are going to remain really vitally important. However, to be future fit, you will need to have a website or a digital presence also. And here's the twist, though. Online businesses that would have um, primarily been launched as online only businesses, if they want to succeed long term, they're actually also going to need physical store presence in order to do so. It is actually the blend of both that's uh, really important. So whilst the store might have felt like the poor relation over the last five years or so um, to online shopping, it will be just as important a channel as either online or as social media or social commerce. You actually need all three to be future fit. This is a, a picture of a chap called Doug Stevens. He's, he's quite a well-known retail futurist. Um, he, um, he wrote a book called Re-Engineering Retail a few years ago. 
And um, he talks about the store being where customers are won and where customers are converted and engaged with. And while some of them may still then shop online, um, the in-store experience will always be that way of being, bringing people together and really engaging with the, the customer. So to quote Doug Stevens, ignore this at your peril. You, you do need the store. And, and I just want to flesh this out a little bit for you. So back in the 90s and the noughties, the, the big boys in retail, the, the, the really big chains, so to speak, um, strategy wise, it was all about a race for space um, all the big players were rushing to have a market presence in virtually every market. And uh, if I think back to my time in Dorothy Perkins in the at the start of the 90s, I think at one point we had 540 stores just between England and Ireland just for that one brand. And about a third of those stores ran at a loss. And that was OK. That was part of the strategy. It was like a dog with a long tail, so to speak. And a lot of the profit was made in the top 20 percent of the business. There was a middle of the road section of the business that, um, you know, washed its own face and traded quite well. And then that bottom third was non profitable. But it was important for the business to have that market presence in those markets. What we've been seeing over the last five or six years prior to COVID was those legacy retailers starting to rush to shrink their estates. So bear in mind that some of those businesses will be tied into very, very long leases, maybe 30, 40 year leases. So a lot of those legacy retailers have been spending the last few years working very hard to shrink those estates and to close all of those secondary stores that aren't profitable. So the strategy for a lot of the legacy retailers and the big boys at the moment is about having few fewer, bigger, better stores and, and uh, fewer, bigger, better is the strategy there. And, and watch this space. It is entirely possible that we will see a lot of these guys using COVID to uh, remove themselves from quite a lot of real estate. So watch this space. And at the same time, all of that is going on. The e-commerce businesses have been starting to seek physical store space because they're finding it increasingly difficult to operate solely online. It's too hard and it's too expensive for them to win new business. And, um, you know, the marketplace is quite busy. Anybody can be a marketeer now. If you have a mobile phone, you're able to market a business quite well. So. So just to reiterate, to be future fit, you need a digital platform as well as uh, as well as a store. Your store is a channel. The website is a channel and your social media channels are another. And, and because the world has become so digital, whilst people are, are feeling super connected digitally, they're not feeling connected on a personal level, especially not at the moment when we've been forced to, to be a little bit more disconnected. So they will be looking for a more physical retail experience in the medium term, particularly as we come out of this. Stores will be critically important again. Retail needs both. So as Doug Stevens says, um, avoid this at your peril. And I just want to take a quick second and talk a little bit about uh, social commerce, because this is probably the fastest growing channel. Um, social media and social commerce is hugely important for all retail and sales. And I'm just going to share a few stats with you. Um, you can see some of the stats on the screen that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But just to let you know, prior to COVID, some stats uh, that had come through from Deloitte, 55% of people had bought product after seeing it on social media. 40% of retailers were already using social media in some way to sell prior to COVID. So purchasing decisions are increasingly going to be made on social media and that has been moving very quickly and will speed up as a result of what we've been through. And then here's just some uh, some some Kantar figures actually from April. So Facebook a year ago, uh, a year ago, Facebook was quite demonized and we we had the, the data analytica scandals. Uh, Facebook traffic was up 37 percent in April. Traffic on Messenger was plus 50 percent on uh, in, in April alone and overall social media usage was over 60 percent up on last year, um, much greater if you include WhatsApp. And, and just to let you know, Messenger as a as a means of contacting customers has over a 70 percent open rate.
Now, against that background, because we were going through, we were at the height of the pandemic, there were over 3% less consumer goods posted in that time. So anybody that was marketing in that time was doing very well because they were being seen by a lot more people. The second, um, the second general overarching trend I want to talk to you about is this move towards experience over stuff. Um, and, and this has been ongoing for a few years where consumers have been moving a lot of their spending to experience over buying stuff just for the sake of it. And you've probably all experienced this shift and you've probably all participated in this shift, thinking about buying somebody a spa day or buying, you know, cool experiences or tickets for a gig instead of traditional gifts. So consumers are wanting experiences. They want memories. It's all about how they feel. It's about emotional connection. And there's a few examples on the screen here. You know, there's the obvious one, Ticketmaster, um, probably not too busy right now. To the left of them is a, a haberdashery store that has a stitch and bitch. And once a month, it's an open house for anybody who has a craft project to come in with that project and work on the project on the premises. And quite often they spend quite a lot of money on um, on on more more things to craft with while they're there. And on the right hand side is an event within a department store that's aimed at a, to at a particular sector of their customer base. So think about working customer experience into your trading strategy. It's actually much more easier. It's easier than you think it is. It's actually about being thoughtful about what, what will engage the customer and what the customer wants to see. But if you're able to focus on experience within your trading strategy, it'll give you an advantage because it really helps you to connect with the customer on a much deeper level. And here's the, the third trend. Um, so the circular economy. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this term before. I'm just going to read you the definition. Circular economy is an economic system that is aimed at eliminating waste and the continual use of resources. It's a regenerative approach in contrast to the traditional linear economy, which has a take, make and dispose model of production. So essentially, this is a shift away from consumerism and towards sustainability. Now, this in itself would be a whole session in itself, safe to say, but the, the focus on sustainability is not a fad. It is here to stay. And there's quite a lot of new retail models emerging as a result. So these are three very top line overarching trends that were happening in the evolution of retail pre-COVID. And by the way, if you sell anything, whether you sell a product or an experience or a service, you are essentially in retail. So if you're transacting, you're in retail. Quick note, um, just going back to the experience piece around reopening for COVID, uh, post-COVID. So when you are getting your premises ready to reopen, if you're still getting ready to reopen, um, just a little tip that not everything needs to be acid yellow. So think about how you can follow the protocol in a softer, more consumer focused way. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So then came COVID-19. And once we had stocked up on toilet rolls and bought new freezers and filled those freezers and um, had enough food for any apocalypse, um, what did we look for as consumers? Well, first of all, we looked to make our surroundings much more comfortable. We upgraded our homes, we painted them, we plumped up the cushions, we bought new garden furniture. Um, there is still a huge shortage of paint across the country um, and I feel really bad for the white van man who, who, who did painting for a living because an awful lot of those jobs were done while we were closed. Um, likewise, um, fire pits were going to the highest bidder in April. Um, most of the, the stock is the fire pits uh, had fire pit stocks that were maybe 15 years old that they couldn't give away pre-pandemic and, and uh, were able to sell very easily. And of course, office, office furniture and office supplies and office tech all did very, very well. So that was, you know, the, the first few weeks we were in shock and, and then we did start to trade. So what else did we look for? Well, 
With the ac lack of access to hairdressers, we needed headbands to cover the grey. We needed leisure wear and sneakers um, to help our ever expanding waistbands, I know I did, and, and also to help us with this new, more slower pace. And we also needed masks that looked more fashionable. And uh, and, and actually, there's a, a, a couple um, a, a couple who um, who owned a ball gown business, who obviously the, the ball gown business slowed right off in March as a pandemic was, you know, there weren't an awful lot of Debs happening. And they actually pivoted and went into selling fashion masks. And the fashion masks business, they, they sell medical grade fashion masks. Um, the fashion mask business has actually surpassed what their ball gown business used to do. So that's a, a really good example of a business that pivoted very well. And what else were people looking for? Well, do you know what? As, as time went on, um, a, a huge gap in the market appeared for thoughtful gifting. Any, anybody that provided thoughtful gifting or was able to be a go between in order to help people send gifts to people that they were apart from, um, anybody who was able to do that did very, very well. So essentially, um, there was a massive gap in the market here for, for people, you know, we were apart from loved ones. We found it hard to celebrate those special moments and birthdays or to let people know that we were thinking of them. So this was a huge gap in the market and anybody who seized upon that did very well. And as time went on, we, we did want retail therapy. We became a little bit COVID fatigued. Um, and, and just a, a reminder, you know, consumer goods were minus 3.3% on social media, but yet there was a much higher footfall and a higher demand for goods. So, you know, by, by the middle of April, people were getting a little bit bored, they were getting fed up and they needed and wanted retail therapy. And yes, we were bored. We wanted anything to alleviate the boredom. So uh, anything crafting did very well. Anything that would be entertainment did very well. And um, there were a lot of adult children living with adult parents that were doing come dine with me, for example. And anybody who copped on to that, I think there was one business near me who um, who did dinner in a bag um, and promoted that on uh, on social media so that, uh, you know, the 20 year old might have a chance at winning the come dine with me competition. So there are lots of businesses out there that realised these gaps in the market and did very well. And just a, a quick note about why the future of retail is local, in my opinion. So I, I do think we're going to see and we are already starting to see an improvement in the fortunes of smaller businesses and more local businesses, particularly coming out of uh, quarantine and coming out of COVID. Now, don't get me wrong here, the high street will need to be ready. So um, poor retailing still won't cut it. But local business has the advantage here if they can realise it. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, you'll see there the picture I have there is of the tanker and the speedboat. So as, as an independent, you can be much more agile. You don't have all those levels of bureaucracy that the legacy retailers have. And that's why we're seeing that distress in those legacy businesses, because it's very hard for them to um, to, to, to make change. Um, whereas as, as an independent, you actually can make decisions quite quickly. You can change direction quite quickly if it's needed. Also, as a smaller business, you're actually more connected to your customer on, a, on an actual a physical or an, a, a human level. So whilst big business might have all the CRM systems and all, all the schnazzy gear, the fact of the matter is, you know your customers more intimately, mainly because you spend a lot of time with them and, and, and or you, you went into business because you share a lot of interest for them. Now, for a lot of those legacy guys and the bigger businesses, that connection has diluted hugely as they've grown and they've quite often missed the clues that the consumer is changing. And that's actually what you're seeing playing out in those apocalyptic headlines. So again, businesses that have lost, um, you know, th those, those tough headlines are around the businesses that have maybe lost a little bit of that connection with their customer. So going forward, experience and how customers feel are going to be increasingly important currency. And as an independent, it is easier for you to move on this trend because you know exactly who you're dealing with and what they want and like. And then, the, the you know, I already mentioned that um, marketing has already had its um, revolution. So from a 
point of view of as an independent business, you've never had as good an opportunity to be able to market for yourselves. We all have a phone. We all have these amazing tools in our hands that can help us. Social commerce is acutely on the rise. And as I said, 60% of people are influenced by digital content when shopping. 55% of people have bought product after discovering it on social media. I know I have. And then finally, um, commuter culture. Um, commuter culture isn't on its way out. It, it's, it's actually gone. It's dead. Um, and a lot of that is generational. It was always going to happen. So, so although COVID has really sped up that process, this was always going to happen. So our kids um, weren't seeing the value in driving a 90 minute you know, drive to then unproductively to then go and do an eight hour shift at work to drive for 90 minutes on the way home. And um, so if you combine that generational change and then from a point of view of that diesel is on its way out, there's this whole carbon footprint and environmental pressure. So, you know, commuting had a very limited lifespan left. And what's happened is the, the pandemic has really, really accelerated that trend. And again, you know, we're finding that remote working is 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 working for a lot of people. So um, this is going to really help a lot of those commuter belt towns. So while those people are remaining working remotely and um, that they will stay local, hopefully live local, buy their lunch in the town, visit the town after work. Um, this could all be to the advantage of local towns and a little bit of infrastructure work is needed there to support it. But um, lots of reasons why local is the future. So I just want to translate how some of these trends could move towards tourism and the staycation opportunity this year. So what may the Irish staycationer customer uh, need, seek or want? Well, actually, the key thing they're going to be looking for is reunion, particularly um, after what we've all just been through. So they'll be looking for family reunion romantic reunion, but above all, safe reunion. So reunion is a, a really key thing um, that the consumers uh, has top of mind. And adventure. So we've all been looking at the same, the same four walls and the same garden for many, many months. People are going to be looking for activities. They're going to be looking for new and beautiful landscape and scenery. They're going to be looking to get away and, um, and relax. And from a business point of view, there's going to be a real need for support with essential business travel. You're going to find that there's going to be a demand for support with providing some sort of a business base camp, particularly for businesses who have, you know, a very well spread workforce. So there is going to be a need in the market for a business base camp for businesses to have regular meetings. Uh, I'm sure you, you all heard the announcement that Facebook are not bringing any of their people back into their main central HQ and Twitter aren't for the next wee while either. And then, you know, also um, regular meetings or just a safe space to have a, a meeting place in general. And then from an events point of view, now that the reopening has sped up, um, there's obviously the demand for um, weddings, funerals and those milestone events. And then, of course, I can't talk to anybody in Sligo without talking about the phenomenon that is normal people. So there were two major shows during lockdown. There was Tiger King and there was Normal People. They were the two hits of lockdown. And I think Normal People has done an awful lot more for Ireland than Tiger King will have done for the US, uh, mind you. The locations and the sheer, the sheer beauty and charm of them are going to be of great interest. And you may have seen these couple of examples already. So these are a couple of examples of the normal people effect. So on the left hand side here, this is um, a West Coast jewellery store who, upon hearing that Paul Meskell um, had an Instagram page just for the necklace around his neck, they posted several pages of every mail chain they could find anywhere. And they had a bumper trading week with that and did very, very well. And then on the right hand side, for those of you who are not already aware or do not read the journal, um, Paul Meskell's 999 O'Neill Shorts Gucci 
um, made a $500 copy of them. So um, it's quite phenomenal, the power of, of normal people. So don't underestimate it. And here, I just want to show you a few examples of hoteliers that have gone early to market with ads on social media. So there's a couple of ads there from the, the Radisson. So, and, and Radisson has really focused on reunion. They've really focused on reunion and they've really focused on safety and some really slick packages um, pulled together um, around reunion. And then the Red Cow Hotel. So the Red Cow Hotel, um, their marketing campaign started very early. They were one of the first to market with adverts and they did an awful lot of posts around um, safety and also a lot of posts around essential travel. So I think their first ad was around essential travel and being a, a base camp for essential travellers for work. And then just a little bit uh, of caution around um, if, if you're going to market and you are, and I know Stephen's going to talk more about this in a little while, you are going to be focusing on the, the safety aspect. Be careful you don't over egg it. There, there is one um, Irish chain who, who went to market, who I won't mention here, but their, their one minute video almost felt like you were going to Mosney and, 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 you know, right down to hanging the paper bag on the door with your breakfast in it. It, it did the exact opposite of what it intended to do, which it, it actually, you know, for me as a consumer, I looked at that and went, Ooh, why would I pay to have that experience? That's not a nice experience. So be really careful that your language around the, um, the safety aspect is a reassuring language and not too clinical. I mentioned this before, and this, this is a good example. This is a business called IQ uh, Branding, and they, they've done quite a lot of work with a few brands um, in Dublin around softening the, the COVID protocol so that it's in line with the brand. I think there was an article on um, Ireland AM yesterday morning about them. Um, they, they did a tie up with Saba and uh, they, they refitted all of their restaurants prior to Saba opening. So, so be really, you know, don't be afraid. People, people are pretty well versed in the, in the protocol. Do not be afraid to talk in your own language and soften. You know, it's very important that you follow the protocol, but you don't have to have it in acid yellow. You can, you can brand it within your own brand. And I, I've seen some great examples of, of that from these guys, which is why I've shown you them. And then just a few uh, further considerations before I pass over. A huge opportunity here in that Sligo is the second safest place in, in the country. It's one of the safest places in Europe. So you have one of the lowest COVID rates in, in, the, in not just Ireland, but in Europe. So, um, you know, I think that that's something to, to be very conscious of. Secondly, Christmas is going to be huge this year. So, so I know everybody's very focused on the summer season and trying to recoup as much as possible of the summer season, but Christmas is going to be huge and Christmas is going to be very emotional this year. It, you know, not just because it's a milestone year, it's 2020, but we've all been through the apocalypse this year. So people are going to want to reunite with their family. Reunion is going to be a massive part of Christmas uh, this year. So there is a huge opportunity there. And then I just want a little bit of caution with that. Mm. So you are going to be busy. There is going to be really big demand for, for, for rooms, essentially, um, as, as people want to get away and, and, and want to get out of their, their current surroundings. Um, but just be careful that the, the, the demand doesn't drive the prices up so much that it doesn't damage business long term from a point of view of uh, people perceiving or the consumer perceiving um, Ireland as being too expensive. So just a little bit of uh, consciousness around that. And then very finally, just to say that the new normal is still evolving. The winners are going to be the businesses that focus on the customer first and foremost. So there's just a few tips for me. I'll pass you back over to Mary. 
Okay, Miriam, thank you so much for an absolutely wonderful presentation. And again, the questions are coming in here. So uh, we'll come back to those in a short while. Um, our second and our final speaker for tonight's webinar is Stephen Rice. Stephen was the Managing Director here in Ireland and the Commercial D Director in Europe for eBookers, the well-known online travel agency. He was part of a senior team with eBookers, which oversaw a $60 million profitability turnaround of this business over a five-year period. Stephen was also the CEO of the Tourism Development Authority of the Emirate of Ras Al Khaima in the United Arab Emirates, excuse my, uh, my uh, pronunciation. Uh, during his time there, he, saw, he oversaw a 72% year-on-year room night growth and development of the concept of, for the world's largest zip line, which sounds like a very exciting project. Stephen is the founder and he's the CEO of Big Wheel Marketing. He's worked as an international tourism consultant since 2015, and he's contributed to many projects in the areas of national tourism strategies, travel technology and marketing. And he's also involved uh, in a number of travel related investments and private equity. So I'm going to pass you over now to Stephen. This is Stephen Rice. Hello, everyone. Uh, can we just do a quick sound check? First of all, just confirm everyone can hear me. Uh, I'll take that as a yes. OK, well, first of all, uh, I, I want to thank all of you who are attending this evening. Thank you for taking the time out of your evening to join this webinar with Miriam and myself. Uh, also, uh, thank you very much to Sligo IT and uh, Mary and everyone involved there uh, for inviting Miriam and myself to do this webinar tonight. So uh, if we could just move on to the first slide, please. So just very, very quickly, uh, Mary has already given me an introduction, but I've just listed some of the brands that I have either worked for or with. Uh, I, Mary mentioned that I worked for eBookers here in Ireland, but most of my experience in travel and tourism has been international, and it's from an international perspective that I'm going to try and speak this evening in terms of what's happening in the market uh, during the pandemic and what tips and learnings we in Ireland can take from international best, best practice. So if we just move on to the next slide, please. OK, so the first slide we have here is a graph from Google Trends. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Google Trends, but it's, it's an excellent and free tool that uh, Google make available to look at how many searches are taking place over time on any particular term, uh, over an, any particular time. And what we're looking at here is from the start of this year to right up to a couple of days ago, people in Ireland searching for the terms hotels. Now you can see that at the beginning of the year, this was pretty high. It obviously dropped off to a very low level right through the uh, COVID uh, pandemic period. And just at the beginning of June, you can start to see quite a sharp uptick in searches for hotels. Now, if we just move on to the next slide. This is exactly the same graph, but what we're looking at here is globally. So the pattern is actually very similar. It's a little bit smoother. The uptick hasn't happened as quickly and it started happening earlier. But this is because markets such as China, for example, and the US did actually start to see hotel searches recover more quickly than, say, for example, the European markets. The uptick in the Irish market beginning at the, at the start of June was very much related to uh, government uh, um, loosening of, of the uh, restrictions. Uh, it uh, went up very quickly. Whereas globally, it's going more slowly, but the direction is all the same. So these are early signs of recovery in the hotel market. If we move on. Hi, I'm just uh, I'm just looking to move it now. There we go. OK, thanks. Uh, and here are some reports that uh, are, are very recent. These are all within the last week or the last couple of days. and. Uh, basically, what we can see is the, the United Nations World Tourism or, uh, Organization actually put out a report uh, yesterday and their tourism barometer 
is indicating that tourism is beginning to restart, uh, especially in Northern Hemisphere, especially in Europe. Uh, there was a piece of research from Amadeus, uh, which was done in, in conjunction with the Hospitality Sales and Marketing Association International, which is predicting uh, recovery in the primary hotel markets globally in the quarter four of this year. The same report does acknowledge that many of the hotels will have to adapt their business models. And also the World Travel and Tourism Council have been very uh, positive about the reopening of the Schengen area in, uh, in, in Europe and the uh, opening of international travelers, uh, of Europe to international travelers. Those two are obviously going to begin respectively. The Schengen happened on the 15th of June and international will happen on the uh, on the 1st of July. Now, all of this obviously is good news for us uh, on this webinar who are all in some way involved in travel, tourism and hotels. It all has to be treated with a degree of caution, obviously. Um, it's amazing how things, how quickly things are changing at the moment uh, and have the potential to change quickly again. Uh, if you look at what's happening in Germany just today, for example, uh, and in China, uh, there are signs that those markets could close down again or, or be restricted again. So whilst the overall signs are good, we all need to be cautious. And if we could move on to the next slide. However, one thing we can be pretty sure about is that the market dynamics, the consumer market dynamics, in, uh, in, in tourism have shifted. And the shift to a greater or lesser degree will most likely be permanent in certain areas. And what we're gonna talk about this evening uh, is we're gonna talk about four areas. We're gonna talk about customer segments, guest experiences, the scope of travel, promotional tactics. And we're gonna look at what's happening in the international market. And we're gonna see what we can take from international best practice and potentially apply here to Ireland to take advantage of these market dynamics shifting as best as we possibly can. So if we move on. Okay, and customer segments, uh, the international market is starting to be defined by a completely different uh, dynamic for customer segments. So, Whilst the uh, typical demographics such as uh, family, such as socio-demographic group, such as income level, th these all still apply, but the attitude of customers towards safety is, is, has very recently and very quickly become the key demographic in terms of how we segment our customers. Tourists are now defined more than ever by how they regard safety in the COVID-19 world that, that, than anything else uh, in terms of how we can segment customers. There's, there's a good analogy that I heard on this. Uh, if we think about how the, the UK political landscape was defined by left, middle or right in terms of political uh, landscape before Brexit, whereas now the UK political landscape is pretty much defined by your position on Brexit. It's like that with the tourism market here. Customers are now being defined by where they segment with regard to their whole attitude towards safety. So if we move on to the next slide, we will look at the first of those customer segments, and there are three. And the first one would be the highly sensitive customer. Now, these are the customers that are probably less frequent travelers. Uh, they're gonna be not as experienced. Uh, they are likely to include groups with older members. So one of the things that we touched on previously in, in Miriam's presentation was reunions. Uh, it, it's likely that the reunion groups would be tending towards this segment. Also, if we look at families with young children, now these groups will be inclined to thoroughly check what's happening with a, the with a property in terms of the COVID-19 safety measures. Uh, they'll be checking in advance, they'll be ringing the hotel, they'll be asking their immediate peer group, what do you think of this hotel, that hotel, what their experiences are, and they will be seeking very clear evidence 
of the safety measures that they uh, expect upon arrival during their stay, but also before their stay as well. So the, the, uh, the research period and also the booking to stay period uh, is going to be a window where evidence of safety is going to need to be apparent. Now, if we just move on to the next slide. So the second group uh, we've defined as alert pragmatics. So these could be older high frequency travelers. So business travelers, for example, would, would be considered uh, alert pragmatics. Also, if we look at the meetings, incentives, conferences, events, the MICE group would probably fall into this group. Now, because this group is experienced in travel, they feel that they probably know what to look for. They are concerned about safety. They want to make sure that all the proper protocols and uh, measures are observed. However, they're likely to be treat them as a secondary factor. They, it won't be the main thing for them, uh, but it will be important. Now, these particular, uh, this segment, their guest behavior, when they arrive at the property, how they interact with the property, how they interact with staff, what they do essentially will probably be the most similar to what it would have been before the pandemic in terms of these segments. Now, if we just move on to the next slide. And then we've got the, the third segment. We've got what we call the leisure priority. Uh, and this typically would be couples without kids. This could be young adults. Uh, this could be experienced seekers, so groups of people, uh, surfers, for example, that type of thing. Uh, now, this group will probably make some checks in terms of property safety measures in advance, but very little. It, it, it's, not, it's not their big thing. They're really, uh, they, they wish the pandemic would just go away and they're quite uh, risk adverse, not interested so much. And in fact, the, the key thing with this group is that many of them will be frustrated at what they see as overprotective practices. Now, I've been on quite a lot of webinars in the last uh, month or so with uh, US based hotel groups, and this is this segment is coming through very strongly. And there's quite a lot of reports of uh, guests which fall into this segment making complaints to property saying, hey, you know, you guys are paranoid and I wouldn't have known had I, I would have, wouldn't have come here had I have known about this, et cetera. Uh, and this, so th this group is, you know, potentially there could be big changes in terms of how they would interact with the property now compared to the way they would have interacted with the property previously. But the, the key thing with these segments at the moment for, 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 uh, for the hospitality market is that you understand which one of these three segments your customers fall into. And we're going to talk about guest experience next, but it's super important that your property has the right the segment that your guests are falling into. OK, can we move on to the next slide? And we're going to talk a bit about guest experiences here. OK, so um, if we just move on to, to, to the next slide. OK, so the recognition of safety, how safety is handled, how it is visualized, how the staff are trained is going to be an integral part of the guest experience and the customer segments. And most hotels will have a good sense of how their customer segments fall into the, the new segments we've just described. That will be a real important feature uh, for, for hotels now to make sure they get the guest experience right to meet the segment. Now, properties can now position safety as a unique selling point within their customer value proposition, again, with the segment in mind, but it just highlights how crucial it is to understand which segment your typical customer actually belongs to and, and what your property will do to tailor the uh, safety proposition to meet that segment. If we can just move on. OK, now. In terms of hotels, there's obviously we've got independent hotels and we've got branded hotels. Now, again, from some of the uh, forums that I've been involved in, 
the sentiment seems to be that branded hotels are considered to be safer than independent hotels. Now, there's no actual reason for this other than the fact that the consumer is defaulting to a position of thinking that uh, because a hotel is a Hilton or a Radisson or a Marriott, that they will have a top-down approach, a top-down regime, which is being applied to all the hotels. So this is why for independent hotels, and obviously that is the majority of hotels in Ireland, the COVID sa safety measures must be seen and understood by guests. Okay, now there's the degree to which they need to be seen and understood, and we'll talk about that in a minute. However, any lapse in safety experience is, is potentially disastrous for particularly an independent hotel at the moment. That's going to direct guests to branded hotels. It's going to make them think, well, you know, uh, if we stayed with this branded hotel, they have their safety all sorted out. So that's the way they're going to go. So it, it, it's extremely important for, for the independent hotels to really ensure that their safety measures are understood by guests but are appropriate. If we move on. OK, so I'm going to echo a little bit of what Miriam was talking about in her presentation. So even though the safety segment, the safety proposition has to be top of mind, it does need to be uh, warm. It does need to be soft. It does need to be uh, welcoming in terms of how it manifests itself in uh, different properties. Now, that, that it still can be quite alternative. If you have a young segment, it still can be quite conservative. If you have an older, more sensitive segment, you can incorporate humorous aspects into it. Uh, Miriam mentioned in her presentation that we don't have to use this yellow, uh, and I think everyone would absolutely agree with that. Uh, soft color palettes uh, are very much the advised way of uh, handling your uh, safety signage. Some hotels in the US have been using clear masks so that guests can see staff smiling. Uh, some have been using these um, uh, full face cover masks, which are a little bit like a welder would use. I, I don't know what they're called. Now, there's a bit of a debate at the moment as to whether they are uh, the preferred option or not. Uh, on the positive side, uh, the guests can clearly see the faces of the staff. They can smile, they can talk. However, it does look a bit industrial is the is the other side. So each property will have to decide what the most appropriate approach for that is. Uh, and again, I'll just repeat again that it's important that how the safety measures are presented are in step with the core hotel brand values on the segment. There's, there's no point in uh, if, if, you, if you are a, you know, a, a independent boutique hotel with a very left left of center value proposition. Well, then your safety measures need to need to fall in line with that as well. OK, we'll move on to the next slide, please. OK, now an interesting feature of uh, the whole hotels dealing with safety is that there potentially could be a, an opportunity for hotels to gain share from Airbnb. All of us know that uh, Airbnb has been the biggest disruptor to the hotel market in the past five or six years. However, at the moment, consumers are perceiving hotels to be safer than Airbnbs, okay, and other forms of accommodation, in fact. Uh, that's not a universally held view. There are some sentiments in the market that hotels, because of the larger number of guests, pose a bigger risk in terms of more potential cross-contamination. However, generally, at the moment, uh, hotels are being perceived as safer. The other thing that we can say is that Airbnb was slower to see the growth in searches. So if we think about the Google Trends graphs we were looking at er earlier, Airbnb didn't grow as fast or as quickly as hotels. So the consumer, when they're reactivating their interest in tourism, is going to hotels first. So this is an opportunity for hotels to take advantage of those changing market dynamics. Now, I think that uh, the advice would be to do that in a soft, indirect way, rather than to do it in an aggressive, challenging way. 
uh, because everything could change again very quickly, as I've mentioned earlier. However, this is an opportunity that all hotels should think about at the moment and how they can make advantage of it. OK, we can move on. And then another thing that we need to think about is that we're in the hospitality industry, we're not hospitals. And the balance between keeping the guests safe and creating an overly restrictive environment must be observed. Now, Miriam had mentioned uh, an example uh, of a video earlier. Uh, I have seen a couple of examples in the last week or so of hotels in Ireland. And again, I'm, I'm not going to name them, but uh, I, I saw one uh, Direct to site, uh, direct hotel website this week, which had divided up its different uh, um, features. So the lobby, the rooms, the spa, the reception into several different sections. And it had a dedicated section on each one of these assets with a very long list of safety features. And all you have to do is read one or two of these. And you think, not only do I not want to stay in this hotel, but I don't want to stay in any hotel. A hotel is still a leisure activity and we can't go so far with the safety measures that we turn our hospitality assets into hospitals. Now, if we just move on to the next slide. One thing that some of the big brands have done is partnered with uh, well-known um, safety or um, disinfectant companies. And I've got a few examples here. So uh, there's uh, SGS, who, who are a huge global uh, safety protocol company. They have uh, engaged in partnerships with Radisson and also with uh, NH Hotels. Uh, and Hilton have uh, created this uh, stay clean concept. They've engaged with the, the Mayo Clinic in the US. They've also engaged with Lysol here in, in Europe. So, uh, I think this is a great way of handling your safety because what you're basically saying is we've done our due diligence on safety. We've gone out to the experts and they are looking looking after it for us. End of story. So you've given the customer the safety reassurance they needed. Uh, you've gone out and got all the best uh, protocols and on, on, you've gone to the experts, but then you don't need to communicate about it overly anymore. So. Uh, Opportunities to do this, if there are any for independent hotels, would be strongly recommended. OK, can we move on to the next slide, please? And we're going to talk about scope of travel next. And this is pretty much uh, about the closure or the se se severe reduction of air travel and how we're moving on to the uh, staycation market. So if we move on, please, to the next slide. Uh, I think we all know that this year is going to be all about staycations and just to preface that we'll talk a little bit about flights in Europe. So the information here I've got is from Eurocontrol and it's only a couple of days old and uh, European flights uh, had declined in June by mid June year on year by 78 percent just just to put everything in perspective and, and that's an enormous number of flights uh, that, that the air traffic market has declined by. Now, the same set of data has forecast month by month increases for the remainder of 2020 and, and indeed on into the first quarter of 2021. But even by the end of 2020, the forecasted position is, is, is going to be approximately still minus 20%, which is still a huge decline in flights. And even if this flight number does go up, uh, there's a huge amount of cons uh, uncertainty at the moment about customers' concern about taking flights. Uh, whether so, for for example, um, uh, I travel a lot to uh, Dubai, and uh, the the United Arab Emirates have just uh, announced that uh, they are going to open up uh, for international travels. There was various restrictions in place but they're going to test everybody when they arrive. You know, what sort of traffic congestion is that going to create at airports? Uh, what, what is the airport experience going to be like? What is the flying experience going to be like? Uh, there's so much uncertainty over this that the air market, of course, will come back, but when and how, we just don't know yet at the moment. And if we move on to the next slide, 
this means that staycations are, are going to be the thing for the short to medium term. Now, just to look at staycations in Ireland here, just to take, take us off the international track for a minute. OK, staycations were already very popular in Ireland before uh, COVID-19. Uh, and I've got some data here from uh, from Falsha Ireland. Uh, domestic individuals and couples were were the biggest source of business for Irish hotels last year. Um, at the same time, uh, there were over 11 million uh, overseas visitors last year in Ireland and over 80 million room nights generated. So there's going to be a massive chunk in the supply of visitors and all of us all the hotels, all of most of you who are on this webinar are going to be looking to fill those gaps with stake, mainly with staycation traffic. And if we just move on to the next slide. OK, the good news is and we're going back to some Google Trends here that staycation uh, searches have taken a pretty big bump upwards since the beginning of June, pretty much in line with what we've seen with the hotel. So this has had a lot of hotels thinking, great, we can we can recoup some of our business and we can recoup some of our revenue. But this is where hoteliers have to be extremely careful. And if we just move on to the next slide. Pricing strategy is going to be absolutely of the utmost importance for the staycation market. So for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, the travel within Ireland isn't going to be as much of an issue. So typically a staycation prior to COVID-19 was uh, maybe a couple getting away for a weekend, you know, so uh, or an older couple getting away for the kids for a weekend or a family going away for a short break. Uh, and because a lot of people had had their main holiday already, uh, they would think, well, you know, we don't want to travel two hours. We don't want to travel three hours. All bets are off in that department at the moment. So travel distance and the amount of time people are willing to travel for staycation, that they'll basically go anywhere in Ireland. And that effectively gives them greater choice because hotels they wouldn't have considered previously, they will consider now. The next thing is that to have a short term focus uh, on, re on on overcompensating for reduced ADRs and rev powers could really negatively affect customer sentiment. Now, I don't have any hard data on this at the moment, but anecdotally, I'm hearing a lot of consumers saying that they're shocked at uh, hotel prices in the summer. Uh, and, and, and this is where we really have to be very careful as hoteliers. We want to recoup, certainly, and we want to price appropriately, but if we go too far, it, it, it really could have a, a negative effect on consumer sentiment. Conversely, we can't excessively discount either because that's even worse. That can have a permanent uh, depression on prices in the market uh, and, and it can devalue the service and, and the rates that, willing, that, 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 that uh, tourists are willing to pay. So we have to be very, very careful about this and really think carefully about our pricing strategy. One other thing to mention as well is that the average length of stay is likely to increase. So we need to think about that as well. The, uh, and another thing is that the opportunity to cross sell within a hotel stay is going to increase as well with average length of stay increasing. And then if we move on to the next slide, and this is the last part, we're going to talk about some promotional tactics in a few different areas that we can consider to uh, help ourselves in the short to medium term. And if we just move on to the first one, which is uh, digital marketing. OK, now digital marketing, we could we could do an entire course on digital marketing. Uh, I've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to talk about three things which, in my experience, would move the needle for hotels more than anything else. The first thing is uh, email marketing. Now, uh, there's a, a study this year uh, by eMarketer uh, estimated that email marketing is estimated to generate four times more return on investment than other digital channels. That, that might sound, wow, that might sound pretty shocking. I can tell you from my experience working in eBookers in particular, where you know we had huge multi-million uh, uh, euro uh, budgets for marketing. This is absolutely true. Uh, we operated with a two million person database, a big database, and 
simply by using emails and promo codes together, we could see huge up upticks in, in revenue. So what I'd say to everyone is email marketing has to be part of your digital strategy. It, it's going to get you the biggest ROI if done correctly. The second thing is uh, mobile. Now, uh, Focusrite are estimating that 40% of direct hotels book bookings will take place on mobile by 2022. Now, as hoteliers, we all like direct bookings. We prefer to get direct bookings to the site as opposed to through an online travel agent or through a tour operator or whatever. Um, mobile, uh, another thing I can tell you from my experience with online travel agencies is that of bookings that were made within 48 hours of stay, about 50% of them come from mobile. So it's very, very important for hotels, if, for their own site to be mobile optimized and to make sure that you're, it's easy to book on your mobile platform and to promote the mobile, mobile platform. And then the third thing is video. Uh, I've just got a, a little stat here from a bit of research that was done last year um, that two thirds of consumers prefer video to learn about a product or service compared to other forms of promotion. I, I don't think that will surprise anyone. But I think what I can say to, to anyone who's involved in the hotel or hospitality business, you will lose bookings if you don't have video to promote yourself. And the second thing is video production does not have to be expensive. Uh, um, there is a perception that you need to bring a whole film crew in and almost make a Holly production out of Hollywood production out of producing videos. You, you don't. You can do simple videos with day-to-day uh, -day equipment such as uh, smartphones and usually there'll be somebody within the hotel staff who's got some sort of experience of doing basic video production. For a five star, 500 key property, yeah, okay, you're gonna have to invest some time in video, but video is A, essential, but B, it's not out of reach. If we can move on to the next slide. Empathy promotions. This is something that's happening a lot internationally uh, in light of COVID-19, and I've just given a, a couple of examples here. So uh, some hotels are promoting Zoom fatigue promotion for business meetings. I think most of us probably have Zoom or online meeting fatigue at this stage. So uh, one of the hotel groups that I used to be involved in when I was in Russell Kemmer Tourism, the Ritz-Carlton, have done a very successful promotion in uh, April and May, uh, attracting uh, business meetings, but using the whole Zoom fatigue uh, um, incentive to, to push that promotion. Another one is uh, cooking free weekends and breaks. Uh, Wyndham hotels in the US have used this tactic quite a lot and quite successfully recently. And another thing is keyless room entry apps. Now, this has been talked about for 10 years in my experience in the uh, uh, tourism market. And nobody's really embraced it from what I can see to the level that it could have been. But there is a group in the US called uh, Domeo, an apartment group. And they have, during the COVID-19 period, seen their average length of stay go from four nights to 11 nights, all pretty much because they've got a special keyless room app and they've marketed that very strongly. We'll move on to the next slide. Mixed use possibilities. So uh, in my experience in Ireland, mixed use isn't considered uh, or, is, or isn't employed as much as it is in other markets. But what... Uh, is happening a lot in international markets is that hotels are starting to do short-term rentals and some of them are actually partnering with Airbnb on this. Now we talked about opportunity to gain share from Airbnb but there's also an opportunity to partner with Airbnb on this. Uh, the second thing is temporary conversion to rentable office space. Uh, internationally Marriott and Novotel are doing this already in the Asian market there's a couple of small boutique brands in Europe. Uh, there's a brand called 25 Hours uh, who uh, are in Germany. Uh, they are uh, renting out their rooms uh, on a temporary basis as office space. And then the third area is uh, ghost kitchens. Now, you've probably all heard of this. Uh, this is where you're renting out your kitchens to third parties to use for their own food production. Pop-up store usage in lobbies is another thing that we're starting to see in the international market. 
And then we'll go on to the final slide, which is other tactics. Uh, F&B innovation. So I saw one fantastic uh, innovation with F&B, which is you probably have all heard of the two Michelin star restaurant uh, no, uh, Noma in Denmark. They're famous because they started serving ants on their menu a number of years ago. Uh, but they would be regarded as one of the top restaurants in the world. They have changed their menu since COVID-19 to serving two items, a cheeseburger and a veggie burger. That's all they've got, just the two. And they have been hugely successful for this. Uh, I think with the, the way that the government here in Ireland are positioning the opening of pubs, uh, with it's, you're only going to have to be there for a certain amount of time and you're going to have to have food with it. This presents opportunities for hotels. We're gradually moving towards a more European model uh, whereby the consumer sees food and beverage as the same thing rather than separate. And this is going to create uh, opportunities for hotels here in Ireland. Every hotel has got their own way in which they can innovate on this, but it's definitely something to consider. Cooperation with destination marketing companies, local partners, transport providers. Again, in my experience, this doesn't happen as much in Ireland as it does in other markets. And with the staycation market and the, the probability that people are going to be having longer lengths of stays, they're going to be wanting to do more on their staycation. It's not just going to be a, a, a flop and drop where they come along, they spend two nights, they relax. They're going to want to do more. Ireland is blessed with some of the most fantastic natural resources for tourism in the world. And I think hotels really need to start thinking about up on their cooperation with these local partners and putting packages together. And finally, we're talking about the book to stay window experience. And uh, I just want to reference a point that Miriam made in her presentation, which was experience over stuff. Now it's becoming, and it's an emerging trend in the hotel market that uh, once a customer books, they enjoy seeing communication from the hotel, particularly on the video side and on mobile platform to see what's happening with that hotel. Okay, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, you're arriving on XYZ or um, resending of information that they don't need already, but it can be almost like, uh, almost like your own one-to-one -one social media experience. This is a, it's an early trend, but it's emerging in hotels to have a book to stay window experience, but it's through using the mobile platform and video. And on that, thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, I will hand back to Mary for uh, any questions. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, you're, 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 you reminded me of the David McWilliams of the hospitality and tourism world. Um, th there's so much food for thought there. I just want to remind everyone that um, our webinar this evening is being recorded. Brendan's here beside me. It is being recorded and it will be available on the IT website. Uh, and I, I'm saying that because I couldn't take in, there was so much content in the presentations that were provided tonight by both Miriam and Stephen, that, I mean, I couldn't take it all in. And I will definitely be going back to our website for the recording. There's so much material and what you've delivered tonight. I, I really can't thank our speakers enough. It, it's been excellent, absolutely wonderful, the presentations tonight. Again, it's reflected, we've quite a few questions in, and the questions, I suppose, really are split into two camps. And again, they reflect um, our, our two uh, speakers. We have some questions from a retail perspective, which obviously I will be asking Miriam. And then we have a number of questions too from the tourism and the hospitality side of things as well. And I, I will maybe just ask Stephen um, just for his comments on those. So I'm just going to move into the questions because I'm kind of conscious of our time. We haven't too much time left. Um, one question, and I think Miriam, this is maybe from your presentation. This question came early on in the presentations. The question is, I understand that we need to compete with retail and online combined. But how does an independent retailer compete with the Nikes of this world in creating that experience? Miriam, would you mind? 
Um, that's a very broad question. I'd, I'd probably need a little bit more context. Um, uh, Nike, Nike's strategy is very much they're, they're trying to uh, um, move more direct to consumer. So um, I, I'm not sure whether that question, I, I'm assuming that question is about the big boys. How do we compete with the big boys from a marketing point of view? And, and actually, th th that's essentially my, my point is that um, as a as an independent business, you actually have a more authentic voice. There's there's a great book um, called Market Rebellion by a guy called Mark Schaefer, and he talks very much about uh, the most authentic company wins um, marketing rebellion. So that the, we are we are entering this sort of new time where people want authenticity more than they um, more than they will be sold by the high polish. So actually, the fact that you are real and that you can connect with people on a very human level, believe it or not, can give you an advantage. You know, it, it depends. You know, I'm very happy if, if that person wants to, to, to connect with me to talk about anything specific. But mm -hmm. I, what I will say is independent business, it's more authentic. It's more able to connect with the customer on an emotional level. And that's where you, you ultimately will have more of an advantage than you even realise. Genuinely. OK, thank you very much, Miriam. Again, we will pass on Miriam and Stephen's details. If anyone has more, you know, if they require more feedback, that's not, no problem. Um, again, I think, Miriam, you've probably addressed this already in your presentation, but just one of the questions tonight was um, if it is fewer, bigger and better stores, will this impact on smaller towns uh, as really only the larger towns have the range of retail required? Again, so, Mary, I think. so so actually I think we're beginning to see um what could potentially so so at the moment um the, the, as 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 the country has and the world has been in crisis mode and actually we all need to start thinking a lot more strategically now the impact is going to be more catastrophic in my opinion for the very big centres, for the, the big city centres. The actual local towns have, have a, a great opportunity here because a lot more people are staying local and will be working local. So there's an opportunity here to, to actually, for, for the, the smaller towns to really engage and look at um, local business and how you can do better. What we're going to see is we're going to see the big cities, we're almost going to have to repurpose a little bit. So I, I can see major city centres becoming more about events and, and having to be repurposed from how we work, live and play in major cities. So there's a big strategic piece of work here needed um, that's more medium term than the current pr crisis that we're in. And uh, that actually leads me into the next question, Miriam. Um, well, there's actually a number of questions here. They're sort of linked up, but I'll start with the question, what changes in urban centres could increase the dwell time to capture increased discretionary spend? And that's quite a mouthful. So um, changes in urban centres, it kind of links into what you've just been, say, been, you know, been speaking about. How, what changes in urban centres could increase the dwell time to capture increased discretionary spend, which can you... So I've, I've, yeah, I have two ways that I can answer that question. So the first is a bit of an I rule if I rule the world answer. So if I rule the world, um, I would get the big boys, the likes of the Facebooks and the Googles, the people that have money to play with, to invest in some of these conurbations and some of these towns. Because you you know, so for example, for the likes, if if I, I I'm I'm being a bit Dublin specific here. I don't live in Dublin, but I'm being a bit Dublin specific. So this is huge Facebook office in Dublin. And people were traveling from all over the country and commuting to get in there every day. And Facebook have, have categorically stated that those offices are now closed and people will be working remotely. But if Facebook and now if anybody has data, Facebook has data. So, uh, you know, if Facebook knows that they have, you know, 500 people traveling down the M1 or 200 people traveling up the N7 every day, they they should be um, a great candidate to partner with those local town authorities to maybe set up some sort of almost like a WeWork or a remote working hub, but but 
anybody can drop in and work there for the day because there are a lot of people that are working remotely and their surroundings are not conducive to it. Um, so uh, the, the more we could get remote work in hubs that are closer to home for people, the, the more that will regenerate the town centre. The second part of that question is we already have a lot of retailers that are very, very good at increasing dwell time. So we're hearing about this backdrop of you know all department stores are destroyed and you know the department store model is is dead and and then you look at done stores you know love them or loathe them done stores strategically have done an exceptional job of reinventing themselves and everything they've done has been about increasing dwell time right down from their store design to the fact that there's a coffee machine beside where you get your trolley there's a coffee cup holder in the trolley everything is about increasing dwell time and, in and increasing average transaction value you. So, you know, we have some exceptional retailers in this country. You know, in a lot of ways, we're way ahead. We really undersell ourselves sometimes and, and uh, we, we're really well ahead strategically with, with quite a few of our retailers in this country, both from an agility point of view and from a long range thinking point of view. So I think there's a, a big piece to do here where I think that we need a collaborative approach in these local towns where you've got the Chamber of Commerce working with, you know, the bids team, working with the, the local enterprise offices, working with the local county council. And I think that collaborative approach and a bit of a longer range view is now needed. We kind of need to get out of crisis mode and into strategic mode. That's my little soapbox for this evening. Okay. Thank you very much, Miriam. Um, Stephen, uh, you're not going to get off. I have a few questions for you as well, Stephen, from the audience tonight. Um, short question, first of all, um, will OTA's commission be affected by COVID-19? And again, I don't know <laughs> if you can answer that. Uh, pro probably not is the answer. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, this has actually strengthened the hand of the OTAs a little bit. Uh, Again, from the forums I'm involved in and from the evidence I'm getting from the market is that whilst the overall number of hotel stays is reducing, the share of uh, bookings and the share of searches that are going through OTAs is actually increasing. So therefore, it's unlikely that the OTAs would uh, negotiate with the hotels on, on, in, in this area. They're suffering as well. So they're not going to give, uh, in my opinion, a chunk of their commission back to the hotels at the moment. Now, they may work with them in other ways. They may work with them on partner marketing. They work, may work with them on promotion. Uh, but given commission, I, I would predict that that won't happen for those reasons. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, Stephen, this is a kind of a longer question, uh, really, at the beginning of it's a statement, really. Um, it's a, the question is, coupled with the fact that we are all being warned about living with the virus, the fact that Sligo is one of the counties with zero levels of COVID, it is likely to be one of the most popular staycation destinations, and that's normal people aside. How can we ensure that we maintain our warm welcome to domestic visitors rather than greeting them as a possible carrier of the virus? And I guess that would apply to any any destination around Ireland. I mean, it's not just Sligo. So I just wonder if you can make any suggestions. So okay. maintaining our warm welcome. OK, well, I think that uh, a lot of the things that we talked about in the presentations apply here in, in this respect. I think, you know, the, the, the one thing that just sprang to mind immediately when you mentioned that is the uh, booking to stay window and the pre booking as window as well. So I think this is where we talk about the experience over stuff concept. And I think that uh, hotels and those involved in the uh, hospitality industry really have to think about what experience they're giving to people in uh, researching and before they book. And again, the two key platforms there are video and mobile. Another thing that we mentioned in the uh, presentations was, was the collaboration with, with uh, the DMCs, the, uh, the local attractions, the local transport providers. I think that if uh, Sligo, or, or indeed any county in Ireland, but let's talk about Sligo as we're here in Sligo, uh, can present a team approach to uh, potential uh, staycationers, that's a very strong message. If you can say, OK, we're all working together here for your safety, but we're also working together to provide 
a, a totally complete and immersive experience. Uh, I think that might be, you know, rather uncomfortable for some hotels to venture into that territory because that doesn't happen a lot in Ireland, but it does happen a lot in other markets. So I think they are the two things that I would say immediately come to mind in terms of presenting a warm welcome and presenting a team approach. OK, thank you very much, Stephen, for your answer. Stephen, um, I think we'll finish with one final question. Um, I'm just going to read it from the screen here. Uh, it's just come in quite quite recently. Um, so the question is, and again, it's specifically to Stephen. Stephen made reference that two thirds of people prefer video to any other form of marketing from hotels. Could he give his opinion on how he feels 3D virtual tours fit into this as a form of marketing where browsers can explore the interior of a hotel at their own pace rather than a pre-recorded video. I know it's quite a specialist question, but mm -hmm. Stephen, if you have any comments on that again, we'd welcome those. Uh, if, if you can do that, do it, <laughs> is basically, <laughs> is, is basically the, uh, the answer in that. Yeah. Um, if, if you look at, so, so let's look at uh, a different aspect of tourism, which is the museums, okay? Museums and museum-like facilities are moving towards this concept called immersive experiences, where they're creating video walls, they're creating uh, 3D augmented reality experiences, and, and consumers are almost getting to the point where they expect this at the moment. Now, um, what I would say is that if, you, if you're a hotel, an independent hotel, if you can do this, you should absolutely do it. It will give you a competitive market advantage over those who are not doing it, but make sure you do it well, okay? Don't half do it. You have to, you have to do this properly. If, if it looks half done or it looks cheap, the consumer is very, very savvy at the moment and they know this. And that's where you have to start thinking about budgets and investment because at the moment, 3D video can still be quite expensive. So yes, Absolutely, you can do it. Uh, the consumer is moving towards expecting that, but just walk before you can run with that. With 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 this, I would say. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. So I'm just conscious of time. Um, we're really nearing the end of tonight's webinar. Um, what can I say? We've had two amazing speakers here tonight. I mean, Stephen and Miriam, you've given us fantastic insights. You've shared your experiences, your top tips even how you've answered uh, the questions uh, tonight. I mean, it just shows the wealth of experience you've brought to this evening's webinar. And I, I really appreciate um, just the effort and just working with you over the last two weeks. It's just been such a pleasure working with such professional people. Thank you so much. Um, I actually think it's very timely given that uh, on Thursday um, we have the inaugural meeting of the Destination Recovery Task Force for Sligo. So I think it's very interesting that we're having these conversations this week. Um, just to finish off, I just would like to thank a number of people who really made this evening's webinar um, possible. Um, our VP for Industry Engagement, uh, Dr. Chris O'Malley, our Head of School of Business and Social Sciences, Dr. Michael Barrett, and of course our President here in the IT Sligo, that's Dr. Brent McCormick. Again, thanks to all of you for facilitating and supporting this event. Um, I also want to, uh, you know, really to, to give thanks to uh, Jeanette Gillen in the Innovation Centre. Jeanette has been a great support to me and a very good friend. So Jean Jeanette, I really appreciate all your help over the past two weeks. And our communications manager, Aidan Hohe as well. Again, Aidan, thank you so much. And finally, I have to say the event wouldn't have happened uh, tonight. It just wouldn't have happened without the man that's sitting in the room with me here, and that's Brenton Hurley. Uh, Brenton has been the technical support. He's actually going red here. I can see him at the corner of my eye, but he, he there has been, he's been just a great support, and he's given me great, uh, you know, just technical backup. I just really wouldn't have managed this event without him. So, Brenton, thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone's help. Um, my final word of thanks goes to all of you who tuned into our webinar tonight. Um, we had a few more questions, but again, we're just I'm just conscious of time. So again, if you if you've anything you would like us to follow up on, again, feel free to email uh, me or any of my colleagues in the IT. Um, we also can give you Miriam and Stephen's uh, contact details as well. Um, again, they would be more than happy with that. 
And really, that brings us to the end of this evening's webinar. Uh, take care, everyone, and stay safe. And good night to you all. Thank you.